special guests today. Our speaker is Bill Kramer, and some of you already know him. I get the privilege to meet him for the first time today. Um, Bill is a past president of CAS. Bill, what year were you president of CAS? That's a big question. I'm not sure. Was it, was it a long, long ago? time ago? It was during this century, millennium, I think. Okay. Cool. I've heard that Bill is very tall. It's hard to tell on Zoom, but I think he is our tallest president we've ever had. Um, some other information about Bill is he, uh, he makes comics, and I think we're going to get to see some of them in the talk tonight. He is an eclipse chaser. He's seen 17 total solar eclipses. Is that correct? Well, I've seen 17. I attended 18. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry about that one. <laughs> Um, and he lives in Orlando, Florida, and Negril, Jamaica. And the title of the talk is Eclipse Fever and Coronavirus. And we're going to hold our questions till the end, and I'm going to ask everyone to mute. And at the end of the talk, um, the people on Zoom can unmute and ask questions as they'd like, and I will moderate the questions from Facebook. Thank you so much, Bill. It's my pleasure. And if anybody has questions that they do come up with, they can just type them into chat. We'll just ignore them until the end, um, just like on the Facebook thing. All right, what I'm going to do is put my ugly screen uh, back into something prettier, which is, uh, let's see here, how did I get to that again? There we go. Uh, I hope you can see this. Half of the screen on mine has got little pictures all over it. It looks good. Uh, if you scroll that down, then, then you don't necessarily see it. And um, as mentioned, I like to doodle. I, I don't consider myself an artist or a cartoonist or anything like that, but I was the guy sitting in the back of class uh, that looked like he wasn't paying attention that was still getting straight A's. And most of the time I was doodling cartoons of whatever was going on in the class or the teacher was talking about. So um, that that hobby, habit, whatever you want to call it, has continued. So I will be showing all of the uh, silly cartoons that I came up with prior to the solar eclipse. And of course, when the whole corona thing started up, that, you know, there were a lot of us who were like, why do they have to call this the coronavirus? So solar eclipse planning. Um, if you've ever been involved with solar eclipse planning, you know there's a lot of advanced preparation that's involved. We know well in advance where an eclipse is going to take place. Uh, we've been able to calculate eclipses with tremendous uh, efficiency and, and accuracy uh, for the last 200 and some years. Uh, thanks to modern mathematics and computers, we can do it in fractions of a second. But we still enter, end up making these maps and getting everything arranged, then we figure out where we want to go. Uh, primary, of course, is the travel aspect of it. You, the eclipse is going to fall where the eclipse is going to fall. So you've got to make a decision where you want to go. So the biggest issue can be, can I even get there? It may be the clear skies are in the middle of the ice fields of Antarctica, and there's just simply no way to get there. So travel arrangements, very important. Climatic studies, figuring out where it's going to be clear. And the other thing with eclipses is that you find eclipse groups, which have become even more and more popular uh, over the last couple of decades, they book well in advance and they take all the good places. And that's because they're working with people like me that are looking years in advance as to where do we want to go for this eclipse and then make recommendations. And if we're lucky, they say, okay, would you come along and do a talk? about eclipses and we'll pay a portion of your fee. So um, the, the solar eclipse that was coming up in December, uh, back when we were considering that one for 2020, there, that seemed to almost be a no-brainer, literally. For It was kind of like the North American eclipse in 2017. There were a million places you could stay and go see. Uh, Chile is nice. This is the summer season for them. It's a bit rainy on the western slopes. Uh, of the hills, but the beachfront is normally sunny. Uh, you go into Patagonia, it's normally nice dry weather, and then out into the seas are normally nice dry weather. So we have good chances. We have lots of opportunities. We have very little infrastructure to work with, which was a problem in Patagonia mostly, where how do you accommodate people that might be coming in for an eclipse? But there were arrangements being made. Campsites were being directed. You may remember some of you back around uh, 2001, uh, over 200 of us went and camped in Zambia. 
So you can build a campsite out there if you've got enough time and resources to pull it all together. So what we didn't anticipate was a pandemic. And basically the government telling us no solar eclipse chasing. There will be no travel. You have 14 day quarantine problems. Uh, all the cruise ships are gonna close down and everything else. And this, uh, this pandemic, when it came up, a lot of us were still pretty much set on our plans. We said, well, I've already got a cruise lined up or I've already got flights lined up. I'm just gonna go ahead and ride it out. But June came up and there was an annular solar eclipse and really not very many people got to go see it. There were plans, people were gonna to go to Saudi Arabia, uh, Tibet, there was a group that was gonna head into there of about 50 people. Uh, there was a group from India that was gonna head up into Pakistan to observe the eclipse. And unfortunately, the pandemic travel restrictions came into play. And as you can see from the map here that shows who saw the eclipse from the Eclipse Chasers website. Nobody logged in saying they saw it anywhere in Saudi Arabia, Yemen, or anywhere in Africa. Not until you got to India. And even then, it was closer only to their hometowns. Uh, the most extreme Eclipse Chaser, a guy by the name of Paul Malley, used to work for United Launch and NASA before that. He's seen 75 eclipses. Now, not all of those are total eclipses. He's seen about 20 four 25 total solar eclipses, uh, but he also likes to go see partial eclipses and annular eclipses. And he was like, God be damned if I'm gonna miss this one, and pulled every connection he could with the Air Force and got to go to Guam and saw the eclipse. And the picture up here is his photograph of totality. That's as close as it got to a full annulus where he was located. Uh, but extremely brave, and he said, I will never do that again. 16 hours in an airplane wearing a mask was no fun. So with the pandemic situation, at first everybody was like, well, we'll just wait this out. Because a lot of pandemics, they don't last very long. Either they get it under control or uh, it, it mutates and, and it's not a big problem. Uh, those that are, are members of the astronomical community that were uh, also involved in the medical science were saying, just wait it out. I think we'll be fine and it didn't get fine. As everybody here knows, uh, it got worse. And so the summer, during the summer months, we started seeing tour groups and cruises start to drop out. Uh, major travel restrictions were put in place where they said, well, the cruise lines aren't gonna be traveling until September, then it was October, then it was November, then it's too late. Aircraft flight options greatly reduced. And getting a flight down to Chile or a flight to Argentina was now a real problem. And when you arrive, for a long period of time, Chile was saying that until the end of December, when you come in, you must quarantine for 14 days at a hotel. Not allowed to go out, not allowed to do anything. And then they also, your returning country, if you were flying back to the United States or flying back to England, they said you'll have to quarantine for 14 days. Flying out of Jamaica, their comment was, is that well, you have to quarantine for 14 days when you get back. So add that on to the equation for the amount of time required to go see an eclipse. That said, there were some that were not going to give it up very easy. And amongst the worst of them is the group that I belong to, the International Astronomical Union's Working Group on Solar Eclipses. And we're probably the craziest group of eclipse chasers you can ever get together in a room. And uh, we were having Zoom conferences and trying to figure out how we were gonna actually manage to get equipment for some experiments that we wanted to do on Corona. Uh, the total solar eclipse is the only time we can study the transition layer between the chromosphere and the Corona in detail. And uh, we need to get some decent optics for that kind of thing. There's also some quantum effects that we're looking at near there, but I won't go into the raw science side. Uh, but a lot of weird ideas came up. You know, how about chartering our own ship? And, uh, you know, <laughs> I actually did this cartoon during the Zoom meeting, and uh, in the upper left corner is Fred Espinac asking, so anybody got any progress to report? Now in the meantime, he's retired from NASA and living out in Arizona with his beautiful telescope set up. And uh, there's a one in the middle bottom down there is uh, Xavier Juvier was uh, in France, and he was like, I'm just going to steal a yacht and come. And over in the bottom right corner there is uh, Shadia, 
she has what she calls the solar sherpas and they're the graduate students that haul all sorts of equipment in to uh, do all the, the work for the coronal studies and uh, they were trying to figure out how to, you know, how to get the equipment in and airdropping was something that we joked about uh, but yeah it was a, you know we had a lot of interesting conversations going on regarding that um, there's another one that came out of my brain the very next day after the meeting about taking a boat, pirating a boat. Pirating a pirate boat is what I thought we should do. And then, of course, there was the idea of how about parachuting into Patagonia or wherever it's going to be clear. And uh, the good joke that came out of that one was, I can't remember who actually suggested it, but they said, well, we're astronomers. We're used to night jumps. And there was the question of how to get across without having these quarantine requirements. If you flew from London, you can't get a direct flight to Santiago, but you could get a direct flight to um, Argentina. But now you have to quarantine there before you could get another flight to Chile. So, you know, how could you just do one quarantine or get in at one country and make your way all across? And uh, some interesting ideas were put forward. Here's Xavier setting sail from France. and. Uh, we figured that's two months of sailing, so he's quarantined at sea. And uh, there was actually another guy from Israel that wanted to join in on this concept of chartering a yacht, but uh, that didn't work out. And then the Star Trek heads, of course, we were like, well, why can't we get a particle beamer that'll get us there and around? That'd be a real nice thing to have. But what it came down to was is that for this eclipse, the key demographic was gonna have to sit this one out. We were not going to be allowed to go. And no matter what you said or anything that, that came back, basically the, the only answer was we were going to have to use telepresence. Now, telepresent eclipse chasing uh, is a, uh, a challenge. In the past, we've had some real connectivity issues. I mean, the internet is not that great in Africa, or the internet's not that great in the jungles of Indonesia. But uh, of course, Elon Musk is trying to fix that as well as pollute the skies for, for Isaac and his guys. But um, it's, it's not always the best way to watch an eclipse. And you're really, I mean, if the videos are bad, the uh, reactions of the crowd and all that is delayed somewhat. Uh, but our South American friends down there, they, they did a fantastic job pulling this whole thing together. And they got a lot of good video that came up. Um, it was a lot of fun to watch it. Now, like I say, it's, it's not really the same as being there, but it was kind of fun to listen to all the reactions and all that going on. And uh, so I, I've always given them guys a big shout out for every time I talk about this eclipse, about how good the, the, uh, the live feeds were that were coming in. And, you know, there were still some that refused to absolutely give up uh, on the concept. And, and I had friends of mine that actually were flying into South America two days before the eclipse and bribing their way through uh, to get out of the quarantine issues. Not that it was any of these three, wink, wink. Um, they, these are three very zealot uh, eclipse chasers, two of them from England and one from Germany. And um, Michael, who's on the left, and I have been to the same number of eclipses, so now he's one up on me. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about his adventure here in just a few seconds. And Patrick uh, is another one. He's on the, the shorter chap over there, another guy from England. He's actually originally from Belgium. And then Jörg in the center there kind of reminds me of an Elon Musk out of Germany. And he is an extraordinary photographer. The people in South America were extremely prepared for the eclipse. There were signs up everywhere uh, telling people how wonderful the eclipse is going to be and how to watch it and be prepared for it and what dates and everything else and times and et cetera, and beautiful graphics that they were using for it. Argentina, as I mentioned, was not necessarily set up for a large groups to come in, but that didn't stop the Eclipse Camp group. Uh, this is the TEI gang out of uh, England, and they had set up tents and made arrangements to have people come in, and they just had to follow the rules of Argentina once they got there. And of course, they were fairly remotely located. They're out in the middle of nowhere, as you can see by these uh, high-end hotel accommodations that they were staying in. That's the uh, the privy on the one side, it was a, basically a, oh, what do you call it, a porta potty, and then with some hay to make it look nice in a bowl and a basin and, and a pump in the background. And then those were the first class rooms. You know, it, it, 
it's, it's one of those things that even though you've done this, you've survived that, you've managed to get it, you've bribed everybody needed to get there and all that, what else could go wrong? Weather. You have no control over the weather, no matter how much you do climatically and now analyzing the situation, you have no control over that weather. In Chile, uh, this was the weather forecast that came up online uh, that day for the eclipse day. And that big blue hump down there that goes up to 100% for precipitation, rain and solar eclipses don't match up well. And so the weather was not going to be very good in Chile. It was looking a lot better over in Argentina. And uh, the day before I was talking to somebody and I drew up this cartoon for the idea that yeah, I'm down here in Orlando and uh, there's Harry Potter has his own place over there at Universal Studio. And uh, so, yeah, you can go over there and buy a fork key. I don't think they actually worked there. If they worked, I would have gone down for the eclipse and popped right back. Because that would have been an awesome way to travel down there. A little dizzy, probably, but otherwise, who knows. So that morning, uh, those of us that were stuck remote with our high-speed internet took advantage of it and said, let's watch the shadow creep across the globe. And you can see the shadow of the moon as it's hitting down there into the clouds out in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Chile. The shadow itself is going to traverse, uh, let's see, I'm hoping you can see the mouse against this. It's actually going to cut right through this area here and across and then up. Now, this area looks like it's kind of cloudy, but in this zone right here is where they had actually some of the best skies. They ended up having good clear skies with about 30 knot winds to contend with. So that could be... I was right out here. So we would have actually had an absolutely gorgeous blue sky for it. And uh, it's kind of disappointing that we didn't get to go on that. Cruise. At the same time, I didn't want to be in the COVID incubator uh, called a cruise ship. <laughs> An untimely cough. We, uh, <coughs> so inland, things weren't looking too good. Just had, over the mountains, though, uh, things were looking a lot better. So now, a lot of very serious eclipse chasers don't do this the easy way. You know, we might have a hotel, we might have a place that we're going to go stay, but then we'll have a secret backup plan. And uh, the TI group had a secret backup plan. They were going to take a couple of charter jets and fly up and go see the eclipse from above the clouds. But they had to make the decision 24 hours ahead of time as to whether or not to do the charter. When you do these kind of things, you basically put down a deposit. It's non-refundable. If you are going to go ahead and use it, you need to call them the day before and then pay the balance so that they can have everything fueled up and ready to go the next day when you're going to fly. Otherwise, you eat the deposit. And it's just part of the cost of eclipse chasing is the way you look about it. Well, this is South America, so uh, price kind of went up a little bit that day. and uh, But nonetheless, they, they, they did manage to go ahead and get the flight plan put together. So they got in these uh, citations, I think they are Cessnas, I'm not sure which. And as you can see, they're just small private business jets. And off they went. The advantage of this particular jet, you'll notice the windows sloping upward. A disadvantage of viewing a, an eclipse from an airplane is that the eclipse has to be kind of lower on the horizon for you to really enjoy it the best out the passenger windows. <coughs> So in the back here, you can see uh, Alson uh, in that one darkened picture there because they're coming up on totality, laying back flat, trying to get a view up because these are large windows in this particular uh, Renault jet. And uh, you also get a lot of glare and things like that. You get a lot of atmospheric or a lot of refraction with the glass uh, trying to do any serious photography. But the view of the ground side of it is rather striking as you see the uh, moon shadow go cruising past. Now, it's something to consider when you're in a jet. A lot of people go, well, why don't you just follow the shadow? Well, the shadow is moving kind of fast. A jet typically travels at around four to 500 miles an hour. That shadow is traveling at over 2,000 miles an hour. So you're not going to keep up with it. Even with a supersonic, uh, you, you've got some trouble because you have to go hypersonic and now you're going too fast. You have to slow down. <laughs> this is one of the better images out the window. You can see the horizon, the small eclipse up there, and uh, there's the gang. They had two jets, so there were five in each jet uh, that went up to see it, and happily they took the eclipse flag. 
That eclipse flag I'm going to mention to you has been to every eclipse since 1972 and has yet to be clouded out. It is kept by a guy by the name of Craig Small, who I'm not allowed to point out for security purposes, in case you see him on an eclipse trip and stick to him like glue. Just know that I would. Anyway, back in Argentina, where they'd set up their camp, they had a bit of a wind situation going on, but the skies were actually looking pretty good for them as it came up. On totality, they got some of the better views from the ground. A gentleman from Germany, Andreas Müller, is the one who made this image, and he made several others um, that I'm going to get back to in a second here. On Zoom, uh, we decided to have a huge party. Uh, the IAU Working Group on Solar Eclipses organized a Zoom call for serious eclipse chasers, and of course everybody had to do something silly. That's Alan Dyer. I don't know how many you guys might know him from the uh, photography, uh, astrophotography groups. Uh, but he, he was upset up in Canada. He wanted to be down there for the eclipse, too. And wearing the goggles for watching it on the uh, computer wasn't necessary, but he, he enjoyed it. This is from a GoPro camera that Shane uh, Washington set up down there in Argentina. And you can see they, are, they have nice clear sky going up onto the eclipse. It's getting a bit darker now. Here's it with the eclipse underway. They had misty clouds, just some fast moving haze clouds that came over totality. Uh, but a lot of totality was actually quite clear. The clouds were moving very fast uh, and they, they created an interesting effects uh, as they went by, as in this image. Now, if you've ever seen a total solar eclipse, there's a phenomenon you may have noticed called shadow bands. And this is a reflection that occurs, a shadow uh, illusion almost that occurs on the ground. These are shadow bands in the sky against the mist. You'll notice that they run parallel to the uh, sun where the slit in the sun is opening up because basically that's what they are. They're just refractive um, where, where the light is converging and creating shadowy zones. Okay, the easiest way to describe that. Uh, close up from Andreas's work here of the prominences. They actually was quite a bit of prominence activity going on during this particular eclipse. Uh, let's see, over on this side, this is what we call a flange coming up over the horizon. Same with that. That's a small flare event. This is a relatively large flare event. This one down here is a flare event that has just uh, recently subsided. Now, up here by this large flare event, but his longer exposure revealed a lot more coronal detail. And so we started looking at this because actually 12 hours before the eclipse, there was what was called a coronal mass ejection. And that's when the, there's an explosion on the sun, a flare. And it throws a bunch of the mass that's up near the surface out into space. And you get these really weird distorted coronal lines. Usually you can't see them with the naked eye uh, during a total eclipse, unless you have dark adapted your eyes or you're using binoculars, and even then they're just very thin wisps of things to see. So a lot of detail enhancement will took place with this particular image. And so we got hold of the Lasco image from uh, uh, the SOHO, and down in the corner here circled, you'll see where it says the Kreutzgruppe comet. That's actually a comet that is going near the sun. It had been discovered prior to this eclipse. Here's the coronal mass ejection. So if we map that same mass ejection over here, we can see, because remember now, this is a high-speed CCD. There's the solar disk, and this is the occulting disk for the LASCO instrument. Right over in here, there's a faintest little dot appeared. And so on that day, we knew that, that, we had met, that Andreas had managed to catch the uh, comet at the same time. So now comes another partner in crime from uh, over in... in the Slovakian area of Melissa Durkmüller, and he does fantastic work with multiple images. He'll take a 200, 300, 400, 500 images of an eclipse and produce these views that show in intricate detail the coronal structures. And again, on this particular one down here in the corner, there's the comet and even picks up the tail of the comet coming off of it. Quite a phenomenal thing to be able to catch all that with a single camera. And all this detail, the, the bubbleish blow off of the coronal mass ejection, the helmet coronal structures that are down here near these uh, flares and flanges. And uh, this one over here, rather chaotic as well. You can see it's got some interesting magnetic influences. The polar brushes, 
here's an interesting thing where the polar brush magnetism has pushed it away from its normal course. And normally you see polar brushes looking like this, but this magnetic influence from this coronal mass ejection pushed those over to the side. And it looks static. When you watch it with a total eclipse, it looks static, but you have to remember that all of these are particles moving at over 10,000 miles a second. Now, have comets and CMEs been seen during eclipses before? Well, yeah. Uh, actually, some of the earlier eclipses that were well recorded back in 1882, there was a huge comet that was observed going into the eclipse. Uh, in 1860, there was a massive coronal mass ejection that took place. There were two different sketch artists that actually worked on that particular one. The one sketch artist detailed it in the way that you see it here, where it looks like a huge oval. The other guy didn't even draw it at all. Turned out that the difference was is that the one had worn dark sunglasses before totality and had slightly dark adapted his eyes and could see the CME in some detail. So, how many people got to this particular eclipse? So here's our new Eclipse Chasers logs are going to start looking like these, by the way. Um, and you can see along the path of totality that a few people did register seeing it, a few people saw the partials, but certainly nothing compared to like the 2017 where we had millions of people that saw the eclipse. So, not a good thing to have to miss the eclipse. It really sucks to have to take the, uh, the pass on the eclipse just simply because of a little bug, a virus that's going around. And uh, it's unfortunate that they couldn't figure out a way to contain it. And uh, it's good that they've got something coming up, uh, that uh, this uh, vaccine that's going to help with that. So we're very optimistic. And there will be more solar eclipses. We're not done with the moon yet. It's moving about a half an inch a year away from, this, from us. And uh, eventually we will have no more solar eclipses. But I assure you, not in our life. So what about the next solar eclipse? The next solar eclipse is a, uh, an annular eclipse that's gonna take place in June. Uh, it's visible in Canada, and unfortunately it's in a rather remote part of Canada, so getting up to there is not going to be an easy thing, and they currently have very strict uh, COVID travel uh, requirements, so they may not be open by that time frame either. Uh, but there are some things that are in the works for going to go see the annular eclipse. I found one out of uh, England here. It'll cost you just a mere 10,000 pounds, roughly $12,000 US. And uh, you can go to Greenland to see the annular eclipse. I will not be joining you. There's a, another alternative that we're looking at out of a flight, a flight possibility out of North America, out of the United States actually. And uh, that might be announced in the next two to three weeks here. Uh, the math is all good. It's just a question of whether or not there's enough people that want to help charter that jet to go do it. Which now, what about the next total solar eclipse? Well, there's one coming up in December of this year. It's going to be visible in Antarctica, which is not one of the nicest places on the planet to go visit. Unfortunately, the climate on this one is a real challenge because the clearest possible sky is over in the middle of the Antarctic landmass over in this area here, you've actually got a pretty high probability of getting a clear sky. There is a group that I understand is going in there, and I believe it's over $50,000 a person or something like that to go on that particular expedition. And that includes all the insurances that they will get you out of there, not just leave you on the ice pack. Um, there are a couple of cruises that are making plans to be in that area. And they're going to, you know, most of them are looking at coming in over here by the, the uh, Scotia Sea, um, south, the Oakney Island areas. Uh, they're going to be over in this general zone, and they hope to be able to catch a good uh, view of the sky. You're looking at over a 70% probability of cloud cover there. So they're going to have to be pretty slick in their maneuvering to find a place where they get a clear sky. As long as the ship is dedicated to the task of getting to the eclipse, there's a good chance that the ship will see it if this guy, if there's anywhere in the area of their cruising range that they can make it. These cruises that say, well, we're going to add the eclipse to a regular itinerary are the ones that you got to be careful of because they'll say, no, we went to our spot. Sorry, it wasn't clear. It was clear just over the horizon. We didn't have the fuel to get there. You can get a lot of good information on the climate um, for the eclipses. Jay Anderson is a member also of the working group of solar eclipses. 
and uh, he has a site called eclipsophile.com uh, and up there he's got all sorts of great weather climatic information for potential eclipse chasing into the uh, future here. But what about ne after that, after 2021? Well, 2022, there are no uh, total solar eclipses. And uh, as normal, our group, we have our meetings, our international conferences then. So there might be an international conference coming up. Um, we're not sure where yet because of this pandemic thing. Everybody's been shy to step up and volunteer. And every time I volunteer Jamaica, they just laugh at me, even though I think it'd be a great time to have the solar eclipse group all sitting there getting eclipsed on the beach. But um, anyway, 2023, there's a transitional solar eclipse, often called a hybrid eclipse. Um, transitional is a better term for it because what happens in a transitional is it'll start as an annular, then go total, and then go back to annular because of the curvature of the Earth and where the shadow is falling. The actual shadow point of the moon is touching somewhere between the surface of the Earth and the center of the Earth. So consequently, you get these transitional eclipses. Uh, they are tend to be very, very short total eclipses near maximum, this one's gonna be uh, just over a minute 15, and the sky conditions up around Indonesia at that, that time of year are not that favorable. Western Australia, there's a small, tiny peninsula that's in the path of totality, and that's been booked for over 10 years. And they, there are groups that are gonna be going that'll be selling it, but again, they're gonna take their premium. Uh, I know some people that are planning to caravan uh, from Perth right into that location, and most of them are Aussies themselves, and they feel that they're going to be able to buck their way into any solar eclipse group. Could be interesting. I don't know what our plans are yet for that one. We looked at the cruise ship option and they wanted $15,000 a passenger and, you know, for a two week cruise. And then what are you going to do? You also got to fly to Australia and back. So these are small fortunes to be chasing some of these eclipses. Finally, we get one back here in the United States. In 2023, there's an annular solar eclipse that will travel through the United States, piece of Mexico, down through Central America and out South America. Uh, best place to see that one might be in the Texas, Arizona area. Uh, they're New Mexico, as far as nice clear skies go in October. Uh, I've, been, I've been out at the uh, solar observatory, which this goes over. Uh, out in New Mexico in October in the past, and the sky conditions out there can be absolutely gorgeous. We'll get beautiful transparency. So um, not sure where we're actually gonna be there. There's a friend of mine that is a guy that runs a website called the Great American Eclipse that uh, has a hot tub that's in the path of totality, in the path of annularity. And I think that might not be a bad idea for an annular eclipse. They're just not as exciting as total. Finally, we do get a total comes across part of the United States, Mexico, into Canada, just skimming into Canada. But the good news is it actually goes across Ohio. The bad news is it does it in early April, um, and which is not really the best climate time for Ohio. As a matter of fact, it's really not the best climate time for Texas or anywhere along the American stretch. So it's going to be a real gamble as to where you might want to set up. If you want to go to Perkins Observatory, it is in the path of totality for two minutes and 26 seconds, roughly, of totality in the front yard of Perkins. And that's, you know, as much as you got really during the 2017 eclipse. Go over towards Finley and it's up closer to three minutes. Uh, head down towards Mexico, Texas, and now you're up into the four minutes or so for totality. A lot of people are looking at the western coast of Mexico, possible cruise ships going off in that direction also. I think there's going to be a lot of good alternatives for this eclipse, and there's also easy alternatives, for, especially coming out of Ohio, uh, you know, as far as where you might want to drive, how far you want to drive, we'll look at the weather two days beforehand, it's like chasing a meteor shower, find the clear spot. But the difference here, you got to be inside that path, otherwise it's not really worth it. Another good eclipse that's coming up here. Uh, is 2027. This is a long eclipse. Maximum duration occurs just near uh, the Valley of the Kings of Luxor in Egypt, six minutes and 23 seconds. Uh, you could go, it'll cross over Mecca, Gibraltar, if you ever had the hankering to go to Benghazi, it goes over that. I, it's, it's a long, long, long eclipse. And for me, it's one that I'm really interested in because now I will have completed a pure exoligmos. An exoligmos is a cycle, a full cycle of one eclipse group um, inside the Ceres cycle. So now it's gone all the way around and it was repeating the longitude. 
1973, I saw the eclipse that was over Africa, so it was further south. 1991, I saw the eclipse in Mexico. In 2009, I saw the eclipse um, in off the shore of uh, the Cook Islands area on a cruise ship. And uh, this one then would complete that exoligmos for, for a full cycle all the way around. Hope to be able to see that one. And we're not sure where we're going to go for that one yet. Uh, Egypt is really attractive. It's got very clear sky. It's also hotter than Hades there in August. Um, but at the same time, Gibraltar skies are not all that good around that time of year. And a lot of it will depend on political situations. We'll see what's going on. I know a Jamaican passport can get in and out of those easier than the United States passports in some cases. But as soon as they find out you were born in the United States, it's just as bad as carrying a U.S. passport. Into the next decade, it almost looks like we got a bit of a dry spell unless you live in Australia. Uh, they've got two total eclipses passing in Australia, or yeah, in Australia there. Uh, but in the United States, not a single one unless you get up to, to uh, Alaska in 2033. <laughs> so that's, a, that's what I've prepared for this report. Uh, I've got some web pages here that you can go visit for a lot more information about the eclipse. I recommend the Eclipse2024.org. It's got all sorts of uh, interesting uh, software that's been put together for it. And uh, the guy's done a really, really nice job. GreatAmericanEclipse.com. You can get some fantastic and cool maps. Uh, EclipseChasers.com is myself. And EclipseWise.com is Fred Espinak. I don't know. You probably have seen his name up here on a few uh, things to do with uh, solar eclipses in the past. He used to be the NASA main man for that sort of thing. And uh, yeah, you see the picture over here, the people wearing the eclipse masks, the corona masks. Uh, there, At first I thought, you know, I want to get one of those. And I thought later on, you know what? I don't want to get one of those because I don't want to have to remember the fact that I had to skip this one because of a stupid bug. And that's it. So we'll end with a cartoon, of course. Thank you so much, Bill. I love your cartoons. <laughs> Thanks. So when you drew your cartoons, did you try to draw like what, like when you said you, you had the one cartoon of the Zoom call, were the people that you drew reflecting the people in the Zoom call, or did you just make up your own characters? Um, well, it depends on, on who it was. There's some people that they've actually said, don't you ever draw a cartoon of me. Uh, the curmudgeons in the crowd, okay? They're, they tend to be that way. And then, um, but most of them, no, they're pretty much in line with what, uh, yeah, kind of what they look like, at least for a quick sketch for a crappy artist. Keep in mind, I studied engineering. I did not study art. All right, so we have, um, so Addie in the chat has asked, uh, she says, hi, Bill, amazing talk. I love the comics so much. How did you make them? I use an iPad with a, one of those pens on it and a program called Art Rage. And um, I sit in front of the TV and ignore the TV and draw cartoons these days. I, they're just fun to do. And they sometimes, you know, when you're sitting in meetings or, or, or reading a discussion about something and uh, you get to the point where something just funny kicks in your head and you just got to put it out on paper or put it out down on the iPad. And uh, in the old days, I did them kind of Don Martin style from Mad Magazine, just around the corners of textbooks and things like that. Then I would go sell the textbook back and they wouldn't give me the full price because I'd marked it up. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> All right. Does anyone have any questions for Bill? So if you're on Zoom, just speak up. And if you're on Facebook, I'll moderate the questions to him. Bill, I just wonder whether it's uh, either the, the, we know the hybrid is, of course, you get an uh, just about so it's at all totality. Um, will it be actually briefly really total? Well, okay. Now that's, yeah, during a transitional eclipse or a hybrid eclipse, where you are on the center line or, or the central path of the eclipse is obviously a world of difference. You could be 200 meters down the, the line and see a hint of corona. And I maybe do not see that. All I see is, you know, the annular eclipse. Now, I'll see a broken annulus because keep in mind, the moon is not perfectly smooth and around it. There's a profile. 
to the moon. So I'll see beads, the Bailey's beads kind of thing. And a lot of times, this has been a real contentious problem, a real difficult problem, I should say, in calculating eclipse circumstances is how precisely we can do that. After uh, or the original, we used a Watts data, and that was created back in the 50s and 60s by actual observation of the moon and trying to figure out where what was along the profile of the moon for variable star timing. Uh, then, or not variable star, I'm sorry, occultations. Occultation timing then refined that even further, and then uh, recently we've used the LRO, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, gives every 50 feet around the moon a 3D image, or 3D point. So from that, now crunching giga, giga, gigabytes of data, we created a whole bunch of lunar profile in, you know, details. And from that, then we apply that against the solar profile to determine where those beads are going to be. So oddly enough, you might see the first glimpse of a true total during a hybrid eclipse off that central path, just to the north or south of it, depending on where the valleys and the mountains are along the moon's edge at that particular time. Uh, then as you go deeper along that path, now you get longer and longer totality. The uh, one, one chap described at one time as seeing two diamond rings simultaneously, you know, where he was for a hybrid. And uh, so that it's kind of, in my book, it's a matter that if you have a choice, go where it's total, because then you can see the corona. You won't yeah, I don't see know the corona during I, the annular phases. I don't know if you saw the uh, North Carolina, Virginia, 80s, I think it was 84, which 84. was a, an annular almost total. It wasn't a hybrid. Yeah. But it was like as close as you could be, and you could get belly speeds all around. I don't yes. know if you saw that one. Yeah, I did. And... Um, I had my camera going and I was snapping one picture after another, after another, after another, and suddenly realized I'm getting a lot more than 36 pictures on this roll of film. Well, I was uh, advancing the camera so fast that I had ripped the sprockets right out of the film. And so I had 30 some exposures on one frame. It, it didn't work. <laughs> we stack ours. Yeah, yeah. It was stacking, stacking analog style. Stacking. <laughs> so we loved your presentation, but I'm curious, what does Jamaica give you that Florida didn't give you? Well, at the moment, I'm in Orlando, and outside right now it's 40 degrees. If it hits 40 degrees in Jamaica in my refrigerator, I'm happy. <laughs> okay. well, the other thing is, is, you know, like I can go out and I can see the Southern Cross. From Jamaica um, and I can see Ada Karina and things like this parts of the sky I've never had a chance to explore before and really really dark sky because we're in an area where there's not a lot of light pollution uh, the nearest major town to us is Montego Bay it's about an hour and a half drive uh, and Kingston is about a five-hour drive away and mountains between here and there so we don't we see a slight glow from Montego Bay uh, we'll see a slight glow out of the Negril Sablomar area, and sometimes a glow from cars going down the beach road, and that's about it. As long as there's no major concerts going on, and they haven't brought in some obnoxious light show to go along with it, and you'll see UFOs up in the sky. Um, or the worst one that got me was uh, New Year's Eve, when we were first living down there. I didn't know about the tradition of lighting Chinese lanterns at New Year's Eve. And I'm out on the beach looking at the stars and these orange things go flying by. And nobody else seemed to be excited by them. And I was kind of like, what, what am I seeing? And I got, I verified with other people that, yeah, those are orange lights up in the sky. Well, what are they? Oh, I don't know. They didn't care. Finally, somebody said, oh, those are Chinese lanterns. Oh, okay. I pulled that stunt one time on the astronomy club up in Youngstown when I was in high school, but you know, it didn't work. I was trying to get a UFO. <laughs> You get a lot of bioluminescence in the sea there. You see that? Get some bioluminescence. Uh, depends. There's a, a particular worm that likes to come up about two to three days after the full moon uh, that you'll see them suddenly glow uh, along the water. You'll see like little splotches of them. And those are the worms coming up out of this uh, sand below. And uh, that's like their mating call or something like that for, for their thing. Um, and, but yeah, it's got, usually you gotta be kind of like away from where the direct moonlight is and you'll see the glow in the water coming up. There's another area where, it, I don't know what causes this one, but there's some sort of an algae that when disturbed leaves this like a weird greenish blue trail behind it. Right. 
So you'll see somebody out there with a boat going through it, and they'll be leaving a trail behind them as they go. Or you'll see some big fish that's moving along the surface that's kind of setting it off. Uh, but you usually got to have pretty good dark adapted eyes to see those. So there are a couple of comments from the Facebook. Uh, Joanne Kahn says, hi, Bill. Great presentation, as usual. Hey, thanks, Jay. And Phil Creed says, it seems like the 2023 annular eclipse is a good warm-up for the total solar eclipse 2024, if you're an imager. Yeah, yes, especially for the partial phases. The best way to warm up for imaging a total solar eclipse is to take a lot of pictures of the moon. If you get to the point where you can get really good detailed pictures of the moon, you'll get good solar eclipse pictures. The field of view of a solar eclipse, the center of the, of the, not, the part that's not interesting is the new moon. So there's your half a degree in your field of view. So you want to have a four to five degree field of view at least to be able to get some decent corona pictures. Most people get that with about a 400 to 600 millimeter lens. And... You know, somebody like an Isaac, you know, how many, how many pictures of the moon did you take before you finally decided, I got it, I got the moon down? And you came to the solar eclipse, and the first time you did the solar eclipse, bingo, you catch a good one. Okay, so that's probably the best way to practice on taking, you know, pictures for a solar eclipse. For the annular, the annular eclipses are, I, I, I equate them to being like you're going to the prom, where it is, the solar eclipse is like getting married. Um, there, there's a whole different level of emotion that comes up over you during a total solar eclipse because the sun went out and I don't care how much you know about it I don't care how knowledgeable you are and how advanced you are when the sun goes out and you look up at that thing and it looks like the eye of God staring right back at you you can't help but go holy crap during an annular eclipse there's no holy crap moment during the annular eclipse, you're looking, the only one would be like with a little bit of beads that are left you and everybody kind of goes, oh, one bead, one bead, ah, it's annular, you know, and that's about it. There's none of this during totality when suddenly the totality goes and you hear the, oh, wow, and that's amazing. I didn't expect it to look like that. And on and on and on comments that people make, um, even the young child will sit there and go, oh, wow. Our oldest daughter, the first eclipse we took her to, she was being, uh, she was five years old. She was being a little persnickety about it. She didn't like the food. We were in Mexico. Um, and, and I decided I wasn't going to take her to another solar eclipse till she was a little bit more mature. Totality hits. She's sitting there coloring. And I hear, oh, wow. Now, she had been watching it on TV over Hawaii. I had to go fetch her out of the hotel room to come outside to see it live. I go in the hotel room and I say, hey, the eclipse is almost here. You need to get here. She and their little friend there go, oh, we saw it already. And I said, where? They said, on TV. I said, get out here. Let's go. It's not the same on TV as it is in person. And when that hits, it really does hit. And watching the shadow race across the ground, if you're in a good position for that, is amazing. To see the horizon change around you is amazing. It's just a... Uh, it's a completely immersive event. No, no laser light show can match it. Unless they shine it right in your eyes, I guess. So I see Isaac is giving the thumb up on that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. Hey, Bill. Yeah. Um, couple questions one do you still drink corona beer after solar eclipses yeah um that's kind of a tradition and you know it's funny we had told the ship on in 2019 make sure you got lots of corona and where we were watching was set up right next to a bar and he came over and says i got lots of corona and i said we're not going to need it we're going to need something harder because we got clouded out and uh, the corona beer just sat there in a bucket nobody wanted to touch it so it's kind of, it is a bit of a tradition to have that. Uh, there's a group out in New York, uh, Glenn Snyder and them. Uh, they have, I can't remember what they call it. It's, it's like a egg something drink at the end of every eclipse. And they mix this thing up. And it is the most god-awful thing I've ever drank. In my life. And to them, beer tastes just as foul. And it's a egg cream is what he calls it, egg cream. It's, it's a like soda mixed with some sort of an eggnog kind of thing. And it's just, it's horrible. But it's a New York thing, I guess. 
So uh, one of the interesting things um, that uh, I experienced when I was there with you in Kentucky, um, I think I was the only guy with with radio sending beacons over the radios because uh, there was a big uh, uh, radio thing that they were studying as the as the uh, shadow went across the United States. You know what was the ionosphere doing? And uh, I don't know if you remember, but I had my radio set up and the antenna set up and sending mm-hmm. beacons and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I'm surprised I didn't make it into one of your comics. Like everybody else is looking at the eclipse with telescopes and <laughs> taking pictures, and here's this dumb guy with a radio. <laughs> There's a. I'm trying to remember what the term is. There's another term that's used for There's that. Sporadic term. E is that? Uh, it's not sporadic E. Is it? What yeah, is it? Uh, well, what they found was um, something called the maximum usable frequency. And uh, what that means is it, 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 it's kind of a refraction index because in uh, for radio, the ionosphere is like a big mirror. And uh, of course, the intensity of the, uh, the ultraviolet rays hitting the ionosphere determines how reflective it is and how, what, what frequencies can uh, be refra- refracted back to the Earth. What they found was the, the maximum usable frequency was at a certain range. And it, as predicted, it dropped during totality but then the interesting thing was was when totality was over the maximum usable frequency went up higher so that was pretty interesting um, to see what the ionosphere does during an eclipse so that that was a a, a neat project that was part of to kind of help determine all I did was send radio bursts out into the ionosphere Um, they collected the data and did the research but it was pretty neat nonetheless yeah, I'm trying. I'm looking up that right now. There's a thing um, that was done for. Hold on, it'll take me a second or two. But it, there's a, a particular group of studies being done on that, and in the night they started in the 1940s with the idea of figuring out what's going wrong with their radio transmissions and why they were getting interference. And there's a particular type of eclipse that they they mean those. And it's a give me just a second here. I'll find that paper. I got too many of these dang things on me. Yeah, most people don't understand that radio propagation is still not exactly a science. <laughs> there's still some black magic and guessing going on there. Yeah. Yeah, I would imagine that that's one way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, especially on the lower bands. Yeah. Right? Yep. Yeah. Especially when I walk around and my uh, radio drops out as I walk around the house. <laughs> yeah, there's a there is a particular type of eclipse that was studied uh, back in the 1950s related to radio waves uh, coming from the sky. And I, I can't find it on my computer real quick here, uh, but it's a uh, maybe it was in the 40s. I'm looking through some old circulars real quick here, so just bear with me. Well, the, what that could be, the difference could be the inertia of the rebound of the ionosphere might uh, carry it a little higher. On yeah. The rebound. Yep, I, I remember it because it was almost like a shockwave thing or exactly. something uh, where they were like, oh my gosh, this is pretty interesting. It's almost like uh, the ionosphere uh, bunched up in the... In the in, you know, as the as the shadows going along, it's like they're it bunched up in the middle or in the front, but something happened like a rebound effect, like you said, Don, after it passed through. Yeah. Okay. Kind of like kind of like a ship going across the water, right? You know, yeah, like yeah, exactly. It yep. creates kind of a wake. Yeah. And, and that's exactly what they discovered. There's a uh, what you're looking for is a thing called a corpuscular eclipse. That's C O R P U S C U L A R, and uh, there's some work that has been done by the hydrographic departments out of Japan in the 50s uh, to mar- map the different uh, elevations as to where the effects were deter- you know, observed during the eclipse. That's neat. I tell you, the the coolest thing for me is I saw it on my computer screen when the eclipse was going on. Yeah. Um, and that was the neat thing because I remember on one band nothing was going on, 
then after the eclipse was over, then all of a sudden all this activity started showing up on this uh, higher band. So and that really was neat seeing them. Yeah, yeah. Good about it. having real time telemetry with your equipment is fantastic. Yeah, they're finding there's some pretty interesting thing that go on that goes on in the atmosphere during an eclipse. It, it, it comes down to you know what happens during the the cooling, the rapid cooling, uh, and then reheating that occurs post eclipse. And it, you know it depends on what time of the day, the elevation of the sun, um, things like that are you know just causing all kinds of localized. Uh, dynamics in the atmosphere that's still yet to be completely understood. That's true. Well, all I can say is, is uh, if you haven't seen an eclipse yet, it is, uh, it is, uh, I, it's hard to describe. It is like a soul fulfilling thing. I um, I remember Amy, my wife, she thought about, oh, I'm not going to go. You can go down with your astronomy friends. I convinced her to go, and when we, it was over, she's like, I am so glad that you got me to go because it was so amazing. Then the other interesting thing from that last uh, eclipse trip there, Bill, my ex-girlfriend from high school showed up with her husband <laughs> and she <laughs> calls me on the phone. She's like, where are you guys? <laughs> <laughs> and she tracked you down. <laughs> yeah. Is this 17? Looks like 17. This yeah. is 2017, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, the best eclipses for some people are what they call the triple diamond ring. That's where you get the diamond ring at second contact, the diamond ring at third contact, and out comes the diamond ring right afterwards to propose. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I've actually been in attendance of a couple of those, and um, right. all I could think of was, good thing it was clear, you know, for the eclipse, because what would that have been like after the eclipse? Right. <laughs> they'd have so to wait. Are... They'd have to wait a few years. Yep. Yeah, these are, uh, well, you remember these, uh, Bill, uh, from, from 2017. Mm -hmm. That was, uh, that was definitely a right. very, very, uh, like Jason actually says over here, quite a moving experience for everyone that was there. I always like to say it's enlightening. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that people should always remember is, you know, the, it goes so fast. We saw the 91 Baja, and that was that was one of the longest ever on that Saros, the uh, almost seven minute totality. Yeah. And you think oh, I'm going to have so much time to do my photography and use my binoculars and do all this, and it seems like whoa, you know, it just zips right by. So the more planning you do, the better. It's just <laughs> during the 91 eclipse, I had practiced changing film without looking and shot two full rolls of 36 exposure heptachrome uh, during totality. And uh, I had practiced with the Quest Star on the moon for months ahead of time, changing film, uh, you know, shoot a whole roll, take the film out and change, you know, put in another roll without even looking at it so that you could do it all by touch in the dark and do it during totality. That was my fifth total solar eclipse and that was the first solar eclipse my hands were not shaking like crazy because that was my number one concern. You actually get a bit of an adrenal rush during an eclipse because the timing is so precise. And it's like, I remember Brad in Africa freaking out over a single cloud and yeah. worried that we were gonna have to run into the jungle, you know, and what if there were black mambas waiting over there, we'll just leap over the bushes to get to where we need to get away from these clouds. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you feel like that. You have that kind of adrenaline rush that kicks in and it's like, oh my God, I can't believe this is really happening. It's really happening. And for me, as one of the computers, one of the guys that does the computational work for it, when the numbers work, there's a rush to that even more. Because it's like so precise that we've got this thing man you know, managed now. And I know, I remember that one trip in Africa, I was so pissed off because the GPS coordinate timers were 13 seconds off on purpose by the Defense Department. And so my calculations were off by 13 seconds, and I couldn't figure out why until I got home and carefully went back through them and then compared them with another set of com computations, then called a friend of mine out at University of Arizona, and I said, what, what, what went wrong with this? And hence, when he came back, and said, oh, you didn't get the circular that the GPS timings were off? And I said, I don't have that type of security clearance anymore. I gave that up in 1997. So... Um, 
After 9-11, you know, they got even weirder about that because they didn't want any GPS-driven devices being used in ways that they shouldn't be used. And uh, so we're supposed to have been given advanced knowledge of those sort of things, but, you know, not, that doesn't always proliferate down to the astronomers. <laughs> Bill, what I've been telling people uh, to do in the last couple of eclipses is um, if it's your first eclipse, don't stress about it. Don't take pictures. Don't don't worry about any equipment. You know, you can take a pair of binoculars to get to give a good look, but it's so emotionally overwhelming to see it. No picture that you take can do justice to the experience that you're having. The experience is so incredibly overwhelming that you don't want to sully it with worrying about you know camera settings and and getting things right and your hand shaking and everything like that just lay back sit in a lawn chair enjoy the view and cry at the end you know it's it's a it's it's you know it took i i i wanted to take pictures during the first eclipse um that we went to in africa and i i ended up getting like two shots you know because my hands are just all you know and that kind of thing so for the rest of the time i just said forget it i'm not going to deal with the camera so when we went to turkey the next time um all i did was set up my camera on a on a timer and just shot a time lapse of the light change and didn't take any pictures i just sat there on the ground with my back to the sky and just watched it and it was so much better that's, that's really what the best way yeah and that's exactly you told me that brad and that's exactly what i did in 17 is I didn't take a camera. I mean, yeah. I, set, I t took my radio, but that was easy to set up and just let it sit there and do its thing. But I didn't take a camera at all. I mean, I took my iPhone, and I did a live Facebook uh, stream um, on my Facebook page, but I didn't do that. The next one, I think I'm going to be trying my best to take some pictures. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and, you know, I mean, it's kind of interesting because, I mean, on, on, on 17, uh, it's just like what Bill says. I mean, I definitely... Have been practicing for uh, you know many a month to actually be able to use some of the technology and automation that, that I ended up using, and that's really the only reason why I, I was uh, what I think quite uh, successful in actually getting some of the images that I was able to get, and uh, and it gave me the opportunity to also basically enjoy it uh, you know on real time, just looking at it. And, and enjoying the, the time that uh, that we were there, while the automation actually did the thing. And pretty much like what you say, Brad, I didn't worry about it. If it worked, it was fine. And if it didn't work, it was fine uh, also. Uh, but uh, you know, it, it's kind of interesting uh, nowadays. Uh, technology will will allow you to uh, take.